you may have heard this particular story about a bishop of a particular denomination uh, one day decided to play some kind of a, a trick on his congregation. Uh, the bishop disguised himself and uh, uh, dressed up as a homeless person, uh, probably a beggar, and came to church. Obviously nobody recognized him. He came and uh, entered the church and people started looking and obviously they didn't see something like this in their church. And uh, the bishop uh, went ahead and took a seat and some people were uh, a little alarmed, disturbed, and they went to him and said, well, I mean, it's nice that you're here, but who are you? And, uh, and they um, kind of questioned him because they were not sure that this person is, uh, uh, you know, someone who should be coming to church in this, in this particular attire. And there were some who were also a little uh, curt with him, uh, disrespectful and uh, probably were in hinting that he should leave, not stay in the church. But the church service started and then he kept on sitting. And of course, uh, when the time came for the scripture reading, the scripture was read and the, uh, the person to give the message was called and it was the bishop who came forward in his tattered clothes and gave the message. I feel sorry for the congregation. I don't know what the bishop must have said, taken them to task, but the uh, question we can ask is, was that church a healthy church? Right? You have heard about this healthy church <laughs> for some time now. We have been talking about it. Uh, it is a it is a theme that we have been following for a number of years as it was set by our home office led by the president, uh, Greg Williams. And we sometimes wonder what are we talking about when we uh, keep using the term healthy church? How should we understand this healthy church? And if you look on the screen, my title is a test for healthy church and how, what is that test? And obviously the book of James that was read to us uh, from chapter two, uh, talks about treating how we treat people. Uh, may I also say that when we talk about healthy church, can a healthy church or can we realize a healthy church without healthy Christians? Right. Uh, can you have a healthy church without healthy Christians? And of course, so when we talk about healthy church, we are also talking about healthy Christians because the church is the people. It's not the building. It's not uh, anything else. It is the people, isn't it? How are healthy Christians known to be healthy? Or how are Christians known to be healthy? It is by their behavior. It is by the expression. Expression of their faith in Jesus Christ. When you have faith, it is expressed in some way. Are those expressions healthy? When I say healthy, are those expressions uh, shining a light for Jesus? Are those expressions Christ-like? Are those expressions, uh, do they reflect Christ? So when we talk about health, we are talking about the expressions that we visibly see. So healthy Christians, uh, when we as Christians are healthy individually, our expressions are Christ-like, Collectively, we become a healthy church, 
right? Um, the expressions of the membership of a church makes a church healthy. That's one way of looking at it. Now, there are various other ways of looking at healthy church, uh, which we will probably come later on. Um, the question we want to ask is, does the expressions of us individually and our church reflect Christ? Is it Christ-like? Is it an accurate and a true witness for Jesus Christ our Lord? Let's get into our passage today, and uh, I'm going to just take sections of the passage and bring some thoughts for us to consider. Notice, uh, beginning in verse 2, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, addressing the membership of the church, uh, must not show favoritism. An expression. That's an expression, right? Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also come in. Amazing. This bishop got the idea from this particular scripture. Right? Uh, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, sit at my floor by, the, by, by my feet, James is actually saying something that probably took place. In those, uh, in those churches at that time. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Interesting. First century church, the church that uh, James probably led, right, in Jerusalem, uh, had a celebrity culture. Uh, that, does that make, a, is that uh, familiar? Celebrity culture? Celebrities, people who are important, people with lots of so-called, uh, you know, worth, value, were worshipped in those days. They were seen as more valuable and worthy. Ring a bell? Don't we do that today? We are, we worship sportsmen and sometimes I'm really, I'm, I really wonder what is the criteria to pay them. I mean, a basketball, basketball player in NBA signed a contract for $250 million. I mean, can you imagine the kind of money? I mean, look at the kind of importance we give these people. But celebrity culture existed in that time, exists today. But what does James say? Showing favoritism is an unhealthy expression for church members. That's what James is saying. Notice verse 4. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James is saying this is discriminating. It's evil. He calls it out as it is. It is evil to show favoritism. Similar to racism, casteism, India and caste. And caste feelings? Uh, very much there, isn't it? What is James trying to say? That all of God's people are precious in God's sight. We are all made in the image of God. Does God have an inferior part and a superior part? Did he make some from an inferior part of his image and some from a superior part of an image? No. They are all, we are all in, in the image of God. So, no matter what clothes we wear, we are still in the image of God, right? So, uh, showing favoritism, James very clearly calls out it to be evil. Jesus Christ invited children amongst the midst of them. You know, maybe they were having a meeting and what did immediately the disciples say? Shoo them out, shoo them out. No, I mean, because they were considered of less value in that particular culture. But Jesus took, went on to take the opportunity to show how important children are. They cannot be discriminated against. All right. Uh, what makes us show favoritism? Now, of course, we saw the example. You see somebody's clothes 
and uh, you suddenly feel that the person is um, you know of lesser status and they can show favoritism favoritism because of that or maybe because of language the the kind of language the person speaks you can you suddenly you can say oh he comes from that area those area people are low you know less telangana andhra or some parts of telangana i don't know but you know uh, or of of family pedigree you know uh, what we come from or let's search our hearts what makes us show favoritism what makes us to discriminate i leave that for you to evaluate in your heart but now let me move to another point why should we not show favoritism why is james telling us don't show favoritism let's go to the next uh, Uh, pa- uh, let, uh, the passage beginning in verse 5 notice it says listen my dear brothers and sisters has not god chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him but you have dishonored the poor is it not the rich who are exploiting you are they not the ones who are dragging you into court are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong now we ask the question why should we not show favoritism notice god uh, james uh, you know uh, brings to our attention has not god chosen those who are poor what does that mean what does he what does he want us to understand uh, in my in my perspective he, what he's trying to tell us is god can work with the poor some of us think god cannot work with some people but <laughs> james is saying that is a wrong interpretation of theology right our christianity god can work with anybody whether he is poor or whether he is rich any social condition any social situation i remember how um missionaries used to go to the amazon jungle and have actually preached the gospel some of them were killed because of you know the dangers of going to the amazon jungle they would go there would stay with them and some of them have been i've i've seen videos are shocking to see how they have come to faith they believed god can work with any social strata any ethnic people he loves all humanity and he can work with anybody and god never gives up on anyone isn't that the song he never gives up his love never runs out on us he never gives up on anybody and he specifically singles out poor people at least james does here and james says uh god has chosen the poor now and th- and the kingdom is close to them uh, why why is that because we can we can understand that the poor people see the need more than anybody else right they are closer to the kingdom because they seem to see needs their need their lack poor people seem to know their lack better than anyone else Uh, i i i uh, that's the very words of jesus if i can just quote that word verse for you uh, matthew 19 jesus said to his disciples truly i tell you it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven again i tell you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of god he's flipping it what he's saying is why i mean the rich find it difficult why because they don't see a need i'm self sufficient i'm okay i don't need anything i am perfectly all right you know i've got everything i need but poor people have a different perspective they have a different way of looking at life they see need right this rich tend to become self sufficient now uh does that mean to say god is against rich people 
Obviously not, right? Uh, God is not a discriminator. <laughs> now, if he said, I'm against rich people, then he would be discriminating. But obviously, God is not discriminating. Everybody, what James is trying to show is everybody is important. Everyone is important. If, uh, I mean, if you look at the law, we talk about the law. I mean, um, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, it says, Do not show partiality in judging, talking to the leadership of Israel. Hear both small and great alike. Don't notice that? Hear both who? Small and great, rich and poor, high status, low status, celebrity, no celebrity. Hear everybody. God doesn't discriminate. God doesn't discriminate. Right? So, why should we not discriminate? Because this is why, why James, uh, this is how James is explaining to us. Because God loves everyone. He doesn't discriminate. Now, let's come to another important thing. James is getting now a little bit more personal, right, as he moves forward, right? Uh, he appeals now to their religiosity, right? He appeals to their spirituality. He's getting theological now. <laughs> let's get into some theology, right? Uh, uh, what he's saying is, uh, some of these people are trying to behave very spiritual, you know, uh, very theological. And so, uh, let's look at the other uh, part. Notice what he says James in James 2. If you really keep the royal law, now he's getting into theology and, you know, the scriptures. If you really keep the law, royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. You see, these people prided that they had the law and they were very sort of meticulous in keeping the letter of the law. We have law and we have Moses, right? But James is showing them they were breaking the same law that they were priding themselves over. They were breaking the law. Uh, they were convicted as lawbreakers. The same law that they were preaching. How? Is there a law, thou shalt not show favoritism anywhere in the Old Testament? In the law? No. But James clearly says favoritism, discriminating people amongst people is a sin. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. James is showing that there is more to the law than the letter. There is more to the law than the letter. And all of you know that Jesus Christ, when he came, he fulfilled the law. He showed us that there is more to the law uh, than just the letter. So those who boast about the law should also know that you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, have an a la carte mentality. You know what's an a la carte menu? When you go to a restaurant, you are allowed to pick and choose. I will take this, no, I will not take that. I will definitely take uh, Telangana Kodi Curry, but not uh, you know, Gongura Mamsam. No, I will take Gongura you know, You can't pick and choose. If you are going, it's a buffet. <laughs> you, have to, you, are, you have to keep the whole law. All right? You cannot have a la carte Christianity. You cannot pick and choose. The law... If you, if you say the law exists or uh, the law, uh, you have to keep the whole thing. You break one, you've broken the whole thing, right? Um, James is saying, you guys in this church are breaking the law left, right, and center, and you don't know it. 
<laughs> by picking and choosing, you're breaking the law left, right and center by trying to think that just a letter is enough, is not enough. Right? Um, do we boast about healthy church? There are many churches that boast about being healthy church or a good church or a successful church or a great church. And there are these things that come, you know, the biggest church, you know, the church that has the most number of uh, services and the uh, no, most number of, you know, attendees. I just want to ask, is there discrimination in that church? You can boast about any number of services and any number of people. Is there discrimination in that church? That's a church that Jesus Christ is judging. There's a problem in that church. And if the leadership does not point that out, that church is of no value in the eyes of Jesus. You cannot discriminate because that church is not a healthy church. You might have lots of people. It's not a healthy church. That's what we are beginning to, or wanting, James wanting to understand, want us to understand. Are we discriminating against anybody in the church? Do we discriminate against our women in the church? There are some churches that do that. They are very strong against women not being in leadership. They should not preach. They should remain silent. But they are allowed to sing. They told they remained silent, but you can sing. <laughs> uh, these churches, I mean, let's, let's uh, personalize it. Look at ourselves. How are we treating our people? How are we treating our women? How are we treating each one? Now, does that mean to say that we are perfect? No. Does that mean to say that we have no wrongs to correct? Uh, no. We have to recognize that uh, there could be mistakes. There could be things that needs correction. That's a different matter. That's not discriminating. If you point out a mistake, that's not discriminating. But discrimination is an attitude of mind. When we treat people differently, one is given more importance than the other. That doesn't mean to say you can't be close to somebody and not as close to someone else. That's a different matter. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Right? Okay, so this is what... James wants us to understand. Now, now comes a very crucial point, very important point, and let's move to that. All right. Um, he says, "What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, 'Go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed,'" but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith without works is dead. What is James trying to tell us again? Faith must have expression. I use that word to begin with. Healthy church means expressions. How does a healthy church express itself? How does a Christian express himself or herself? Faith must have expression. It must result in behavior. Right? It cannot remain theoretical. Our faith cannot remain in the head. Right? It must have application. It must have practical application. Can't help but remember as I read this uh, picture that's etched in my mind. I remember when I was uh, a young boy, uh, my dad used to, you know, work for a company, and uh, you know we were low middle class at that time. Uh, I still remember his salary used to be something like 800 rupees a month. You know. Of course, in those days, maybe it was a little on the higher side, but I remember one morning, he was, uh, there was a knock on the door and he went to answer it, and it was one of his colleagues um, who apparently lost his job and uh, was coming to 
ask for some money, ask for some help. And I still remember, I mean, I don't know what was the conversation, but I remember my dad coming in, going to where we keep the ration, you know, where the rice is, the rice bag. He took a paper, he cupped it, you know how they cupped a paper, and he poured uh, two or three vessels, I mean to say whatever, mugs of rice into it. He packed it up, he went to this person, and he said, please go feed your children. And the person I still remember saying, saying back, I'm so ashamed to ask you this. Right? My dad was not rich enough to give money. We never had money. He gave some rations, which probably meant that the family would have less ration for that month. <laughs> but that, that stays in my mind for some reason when I see that. Uh, he was a man who helped practically. Right? Um, belief is important. Belief is important. It is belief that saves us. Belief in Jesus Christ our Lord. But that belief does not remain dormant. You see, belief is a dynamic word. It's a word that is packed with many things. It has a cognitive perspective, an emotional perspective, and a practical perspective, a physical application perspective. Belief has so much of it, right? Belief, when we have belief and we passionately believe, it transforms. It changes from inside out. Belief is inside, but it affects the outside, right? And that is why Philippians, the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 1, he says the following, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. Did you notice that? Fruit of your salvation. What is this fruit of your salvation? You have salvation because you believe. But that salvation must have fruit, must produce fruit. And what is that fruit? Well, he himself says. He says, the righteous character produced by your life, uh, in your life by Jesus Christ. That is the fruit of salvation. So salvation is by faith. And it is by belief, but that salvation has fruit. And that is the expression. The expressions of a believer are the fruit of salvation. That salvation is transforming us and it is resulting in fruit. And here the apostle James says, uh, you got to go, you got to reach a higher level. And that's where the law comes in. You got to go higher than the letter of the law. Not only should we not discriminate, but we must also, you know, reach out and help. So healthy expressions. Healthy church expressions will go to a higher level. Okay, so this is how I would like to you to understand the scripture that James has said. Now, let's. What are the takeaways? What are the practical aspects? Let's look at it. Why is healthy church important? Healthy church is important because it gives rise to healthy expressions. Unhealthy expressions will only destroy us. It will destroy the unity, it will destroy the loving community that we are. If there is discrimination in our church, that's going to ultimately destroy us. That's why healthy church is important. Health, and healthy church means healthy expression. Secondly, is the expressions of our church healthy towards people, all people, inside and outside the church? Are there any favoritisms in the church? Right. Uh, I, I, I think we have done very well when we have had strangers come to our church and I know that many of you go and engage and talk and, and that's beautiful. It's lovely to see how you make people feel welcome. But do you make people welcome who are your brothers and sisters? Do you say hello to everybody? Do you go meet everybody? Or you have your favorites? Now, you can have your closer ones but then is there favoritism in terms of wishing people in church? 
You wish strangers, but what about your own brethren? Would you want to go and ask, how are you doing? Is that, is that a practice in our church? I leave it for you, your heart to answer you. Now, does that mean to say, talking about strangers, we should welcome anybody and everybody and people who come to take advantage of us? No, I just want to make that clarification. We don't let people take advantage of us. Thirdly, are we reaching higher levels of obedience or are we staying with the letter? If you stay with the letter, you are sinning. That's what James says. If you don't reach the higher levels, we are not, we are lawbreakers, right? Uh, what about our church, healthy church? Do we have higher expressions? Do we have healthy church expressions that are at a higher level? Right? Uh, what is our church doing? I want all of us to th just think about it. What is our church doing? Does it have a love avenue? Is there anything that is being expressed through the Love Avenue? I want our pastors to listen. I want our members to listen. What is our church doing? Just doing Sunday service and that's all? Is there something we are doing to help people? To, to have a healthy expressions and serving people? What are, what are our strengths? Can we use our strengths to help and serve people? So, pastors need to teach brethren that you need to do this. You need to be engaged. You need to participate. You need to, you know, volunteer. And members, you need to help our pastors to make our church a healthy, bring, bring in more and more healthy expressions. Now, we have to be careful in our culture that we are not doing anything to manipulate people into conversions. No, that's, we don't do that. Right? So as we serve and help and go out in the community and serve people, uh, we must do it because that's a healthy expression of a healthy church. And so brethren, as we wrap up now, how do we treat people? How we treat people becomes a test of our Christianity, right, or healthy church. Let me ask you a question. How do you know that God loves you? How do you know that God loves you? Now, you might have some answers, uh, but I'll give you a scriptural answer. Here, in the, in the scripture it says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do we know God loves you? While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. Is that an expression? That is the expression of God. Every time we see this, it should remind you God loves you. He did something for you. Let me flip that question. How do others know that we love God? How do others know that we love God? And I'll only leave you with one scripture that speaks volumes. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar, lawbreaker. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God. Whom they have not seen, and he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I'd like to lead you to the communion at this time.
healthy Christians, healthy church. For us to be healthy Christians, for us to be healthy, a healthy church, we need Christ. Without Christ, we are nothing. We need Christ because we need him to help us express expressions, express his love, his concern, his care. So let me just request you, take a moment, reflect. Take a moment to reflect. Ask God, how healthy am I as a Christian? And ask him to fill your heart with his love, with his concern, with his care. Because we don't have any of it. If we have anything, it is filthy rags. But let's ask God to fill us with his love so that we can express that love to others. As you reflect, you can also come forward. I'd like you to take the elements, the bread and the wine, go back to your seat and then we will participate together. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat together at the table. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you saw fit, Father, to express your love by allowing your body to be broken for us, even while we were still in our sins. Thank you for that expression of love and help us now, Father, to fill us with your love that we might express the same to others, the body of Jesus Christ. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you. That you went on the cross to shed your blood. That, Father, we might be healed spiritually and in every way. Made us whole. Thank you for the abundant life that you promised us. But now, Father, as we partake of this wine, symbolizing your blood, grant us your grace, your mercy, your love, that we might have healthy expressions 
individually and as a church. The blood of Jesus Christ. Now that we have Christ in us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, let us go forth and be a witness for Jesus Christ. Let us express his love and concern for one another. And as we do, I pray, we will all individually and collectively become the healthiest expression of the church of Jesus Christ.